We're glad you're back for Theology Thursday, or if this is your first time, we are glad that you found this channel. If you know me personally, you know that I have an interest in science. I started college uh, wanting to get a degree either in aeronautical engineering or in astrophysics because I want to be involved in designing uh, either spaceships or space probes or space telescopes or something like that. I've always found those subjects very fascinating and interesting. I did change to history because I also love history, and history was a better major for someone who's going into ministry than um, some kind of physics degree. But because of that, I still keep up with a lot of what's going on um, in the scientific world. So today I want to talk about science and the Bible, but not like you think. Um, a lot of times when we hear science and the Bible, our minds immediately run to Genesis chapter 1 and the creation discussion. I don't want to do all that. What instead I want to do is I want to talk about what is the goal of science? Is it legitimate? Does it fit what we read um, in Scripture? So <clears throat> let's just talk about what is science. Science is about discovery, about discovering how things work, um, how they function, how we can do this, you know, step A, B, C, or D to accomplish E, F, or G, or whatever it is. So science is about, it really is about discovery. Um, and it goes everywhere from the very tiny, you know, molecular uh, physicists, molecular biologists, um, doctors, and the tiniest portions, lymph nodes, and all the things in your body, all the way to the big stuff, like the people that study rocks, uh, geologists and massive rock formations, or hydrologists who study, you know, oceanographers who study the massive oceans, all the way to the really giant, the people that study outer space, even though now maybe we shouldn't call it that. And so um, it's about discovery, uh, step one. Step two, then, is about using those discoveries. So someone discovers that you can take reddish rock and heat it, and it separates out iron from all the impurities, all the other stuff, uh, all the, the, the slag or the dross, and you can remove all of that, and if you do it well enough, then you get this chunk of metal called iron. So someone discovered that. But step two was then, okay, let's take the iron while it's still pliable and molten, and let's form it into something, farm implements, unfortunately weapons, um, tools of all kind, eventually cars, uh, and then someone discovers that by uh, infusing carbon into it, we can create steel, which is much more, much stronger, pervious to rust. Um, we can make better weapons, better tools, better farming implements, all those kind of things. Um, and then someone finds out or discovers how to do it on a massive scale. That'd be Birmingham. Uh, and so now we can create these massive steel objects like railroad tracks and train engines and train cars that can move large amounts of goods and services. So there's the discovery part, but then there's also the use and application part uh, for the betterment of human lives and human society. So that is essentially um, kind of what science does. Uh, the reality is trying to figure out what happened in the past um, is more about jurisprudence. Uh, what evidence do we have and how do we interpret that evidence than it is actually science. Science might help to produce the evidence, but the reality is science doesn't always help with properly interpreting that evidence. That's why there's so many different ideas about how things got to the way that they are now. So many different theories. Um, and, so, and there's like four different theories of evolution, even though three are uh, considered still viable. Nobody holds to Darwin's theory anymore uh, because uh, scientific discoveries have debunked some of his ideas about how it happened. But uh, the reality is it really doesn't do that. Science is like, man, what do we know now? What have we discovered? And then how can we use that? And how can we apply this then um, to make human life better and make society better? Um, so that's the primary purpose of science. To conduct science, of course, we need something that is observable, measurable, repeatable. Now, that's why it goes to a lab, because just because it worked one time over here doesn't mean it's going to work another time over here, and certainly it needs to work every time. 
So if sometimes the red rocks can, can have iron pour, pulled out of them, um, you know, maybe that's, maybe we need to find a better or something, you know, or maybe one time you melt it, it comes out as iron. Next time you melt it, it comes out as aluminum. Like, you know, we need some consistency or sometimes there's nothing like it. You know, we, every time we've heated this red rock, we've found iron. By the way, it's what makes the rock reddish, brownish is the presence of iron ore inside of it, like at Sedona. And so, um, you know, it needs to be measurable. Like, we know how hot it has to be for the iron to be extracted um, or for copper to be smelted, even though now we usually leach it using uh, acid because someone discovered that works better and more cost-effective. Um, and so those are the three things that we need. That's what we're doing. And so we appreciate what science has discovered. Your life is, I think, at least more convenient because someone, through a number of discoveries and how to use them, figured out how to get indoor plumbing. And then someone figured out how to build a washing machine. Someone figured out how to build a dryer. And you no longer have to spend an entire day washing all the clothes by hand. You no longer have to pump the well inside or outside to get water. Um, once electricity and its principles were discovered, how do we apply that? Um, and so much of our world now, most of our world is because of electricity. Uh, if you take a byproduct of refining oil uh, called gasoline and you mix it with air and compress it and hit it with a spark, um, it produces a good deal of power. And if we can contain that inside of a cylinder to force a piston up and down, um, we can actually turn a crankshaft to turn gears that turn a wheel to make something move. And now we have trains and automobiles and motorcycles and all those things. Um, and so it's really, your life has been dramatically impacted. Okay? So I wanna say two things about that. First of all, that is very, very, very biblical. In Genesis one, we are told that we are to have dominion over the earth. What that means is that you and I go out and we find ways of uh, well, we find ways of discovering what's in this world that God has placed us in and how to use them. But the primary idea is to use them for good, not for evil. Unfortunately, many things have been and still are used for evil. Um, but nuclear power, definitely used for good, but can also be used for evil. Uh, and the same with gunpowder and so many other things. And so, you know, what science has discovered does that. But science has also done some other things. Science has revealed much in our world in the last 100, 150 years that throughout all of humans' history, we didn't even know existed. So that raises another question. Why did God make animals on the bottom of the ocean that uh, we didn't know about until 100 years ago? Until the Hubble telescope, we didn't know much about the universe. And now, after the James Webb telescope and what we're receiving from it, um, someone said, we don't need to call it outer space anymore. It's outer full because it is full of galaxies, probably three times, at least three times as many as we thought. And we've discovered over 5,000 exoplanets, planets that revolve around um, stars. And we found binary stars and all kinds of you know, black holes and pulsars and, and things like that. And, and um, I mean, it's really amazing. But why did God make all of that if nobody knew about it until now, and there's still so much more that we don't know about the deep oceans, um, about what's underground in many places. I mean, they're still discovering caves and cave systems. Here in Arizona, it's only been a couple of decades ago that they discovered the Karchner Caverns, um, a massive cave complex in southern Arizona. So there's still, still so much to discover. Why did God make all of that? Well, I think two reasons, well, three. One, because God enjoyed it. God just enjoys a big universe. He enjoys the galaxies. He enjoys the, the stars and all. It's just for his own pleasure. God just enjoys it. I think that kind of freaks us out to think that God just enjoying things, but God enjoys it. I mean, after each day of creation, God said, it is good long before he created humans. That didn't come until the last day. So it's good. It's good. It was good. God enjoyed it. He was pleased. It was pleasurable uh, to him. So God did it for his own pleasure. And that would be enough. But God also, I think, does it so that you and I don't get bored. There's always more to discover. There's always more to excite us about God. There's always 
something we didn't know. I mean, what the James Webb Telescope is giving to us is, is flat amazing. I've probably spent too much time looking at some of the photos and things that have been published uh, already and just astounded and amazed at this incredibly balanced, functioning universe that God created. And so much that we don't know about it creates a sense of awe at the bigness and the majesty and the creativity and the uniqueness of our God. And so when we look at all these things, it should, you know, when I consider the stars, the works of your fingers, Psalm 8 would say, I mean, it really is pretty, pretty amazing, um, you know, all that God has done. But I think there's a third reason. God did it for his own pleasure. He did it so there's always more for us to discover. But I think he also did it because he wants us to learn. God doesn't want us to ever be static. Work six days, take a day of rest, but then we work again. Always learning, always discovering. And that has caused me to wonder, is heaven going to be eternal discovery? God is infinite. There is no end to God. So if God is infinite, theoretically, we could never discover everything there is about God, which means that heaven won't be boring. Heaven will be one great discovery after another about the greatness and the wonder and the awe of our God. Because remember, God's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. There's going to be a new universe. And I don't know what the laws of physics will be there. I don't know if uh, sound or light will still move 186,282 miles per second. Um, I don't know if space-time will be curved uh, according to theory of relativity. I, I don't know exactly how that's going to work. But I don't think we'll ever get bored. I think it'll be one awe and worship inspiring discovery after another. And so as scientists discover things, they don't frighten us, they enthuse us about the greatness of our God. Um, and we can use them to make the world better and to make society better. I mean, think about all the medical advancements in the last couple of centuries um, as a result of us taking dominion. So I hope this encourages you, maybe get online a little bit and just kind of look at some pictures of the vastness of our universe or some of these kind of really insane looking animals from the bottom of the ocean that God has made. And think about the wonder and the unending discoveries that we can make, not only about our world, but throughout of eternity, about the greatness and the glory of our wonderful and magnificent God. So all today's just kind of uplifting and encouraging to you and exciting for you about this great God and this massive universe that he's made and desires for us uh, to study and to learn and to use for one another and for society. So God bless you and have a wonderful, wonderful day.